right. <clears throat> All right, ladies. So this is your last lecture lecture from me. Um, and next week, I'm going to walk you guys through your final. Um, I don't know if your sub has told you yet, but you actually don't have a final exam. You have a final project. And so on Monday, it'll be introduced and you'll have the class to, or the week to work on it. Or sorry, Tuesday it'll be introduced because Monday there's no school. Um, and then you'll have the week to work on it. Um, and hopefully I'll explain it in a video on Monday. If you do have questions after the video, you can email me any questions. Um, but the focus question for this chapter is what are my responsibilities and duties as Catholics? The church has... Um, Church has what's called Catholic social teaching, which ultimately responds to that question. Um, so the main idea of this section is the lived practice of a Catholic social teaching embodies the church's witness to Christ's gospel in the world. Um, that's worded kind of funny, but basically, Um, basically, the church, as far as what we're called to do in society, the church responds with what we call a Catholic social social teaching. Um, so this would be our visible faith. Catholic social teaching is the visible witness of a ma mature. Um, so sorry, I like just misspoke. Um, the visible witness of a mature faith is often as valuable or even more valuable than the presentation of dogma. And so what that means is that when people, if it were a matter of words, there's a song, um, maybe I'll send it to you guys, but it's not, our faith is not about all of these things that we teach. It's about a relationship with God. And so through our relationship with God, we come to understand why the church has these teachings and so it's like a mother and a daughter or a father and son relationship that we have with God and parents can see things that are a risk to their child better than the child can see themselves and so when the church teaches on these matters that we don't really understand why they say what they say but the church is a representation of what God wants us to know and if we have this relationship with God then we are able to understand that the church has these things in place or God has these things in place because he wants to look out for us and our well-being and so it's not as easy to recognize that when we just present dogma to somebody as well as it would be if we were to witness the faith um, in a mature manner. And so your book talks about a flash mob at a pro-life thing. There was a Planned Parenthood rally, um, and there was all sorts of yucky signs. Um, um, and so a pro-life group responded by having a flash mob, and they all had these big yellow balloons that said life. They were singing and dancing and they didn't argue, they didn't um, want to fight anybody, they just wanted to witness the joy of life and the joy of the gospel. Um, and evangelizing the world means first and foremost becoming aware of what your actions are teaching others about Christ and the church. <clears throat> Sorry for all the pauses and the ums. Um, Danielle is grumpy. Anyway, so evangelization, evangelizing the world means first and foremost, becoming aware of what your actions are teaching others about Christ and the church. So that means that when you act, when you identify as a Christian, and then you go out in the world and act a certain way, that's how other people are going to um, see other Christians. And so if that means you go off and you kind of be a turd, that's how they're going to view other Christians. But if you go off and you live as Christ has called us to, then that's how they'll view Christ and his church. Um, the Catholic, Catholic social teaching is the body of the church's doctrine that applies to people who live in society. So um, people who live, um, people who are a part of the church, like priests and 
religious life, all of these things don't really apply to them in the same way they do to us. Um, and you'll see why in a second. So the church has the church has um, seven themes of Catholic social teaching, and your book kind of talks about it in that way. They do um, use a little bit different verbiage, but if you, I think you have the option to take the Catholic social teaching as a senior here, um, if I remember correctly. And if you do it, then you'll talk about the seven themes um, differently. And so today in this chapter, they talk about six of them. The one they don't talk about is stewardship of creation. Um, so like um, an environmental friendliness is also what we're called to do. But the first one that the faith talks about is the dignity the dignity of the human person. My guess is you guys are at least somewhat familiar with this. Um, the most fundamental right of all mankind is the right to life. The reason for that is because without the right to life, all the other rights are pretty um, unnecessary. Like if we aren't alive, we don't really need water or food or shelter. And so that's why it's the most fundamental. Um, violations of this right are capital punishment, abortion, and euthanasia. There are other ones, but these were the most common. Um, so capital punishment, we've talked a little bit about, not a lot. And your book doesn't actually talk too much about it. Um, but ultimately, it does take away from people's right to life. Same way abortion is, does, and euthanasia does. And so these things all violate the dignity of the human person. And so it's pretty pretty much as simple as that. Um, the church holds the position that life must be respected from conception to natural death. And so natural death does not mean somebody being shot or killed um, through a needle for capital punishment or aborted. It's um, on nature's, letting nature take its course. And so that's where it can be kind of confusing for the euthanasia one. Some people think that um, they're afraid that if they unplug a loved one that they're violating the church's teaching and that's not the case that's letting nature take its course um and so there's 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 a lot more to it and you guys will talk about it more when you're seniors um but these are just some of the things that as catholics living in the world we are called to partake in the church's position which is to respect all life um each catholic has a defend these rights. Um, so the common good, this one's a little bit shorter. Um, so life together with one another is described by the principle of the common good. Um, so God ultimately calls us to be in relationship with one another. He doesn't want us to be isolated in society. He wants us to live in community and help each other. Um, he wants us to look out for the needs of one another. So that's pretty simple. Um, working for the common good requires three essential elements. Respect for the fundamental and inalienable rights of each human being. Recognizing the rights of groups and individuals to develop all these different ways. And peace and stability. Um, preferential option for and love for the poor and the vulnerable. Um, your book doesn't talk about this for terribly long. Um, I was surprised how short of a section this was, to be honest. Um, but all it says about it is that those with material wealth and power have a special obligation to care for those who lack material goods and the, the ability to care for themselves. Um, and I mean, that's kind of a summary, but we have a duty to the poor, whether or not that like you don't have to be filthy rich to help the poor. Anybody who has an abundance or anything they don't need while others are in need, we all have a responsibility. It might not be a monetary responsibility. Um, like we might not have to give them money, but we are we do have a responsibility to love the poor and the vulnerable. Um, we're called to respond to their needs. Um, one way to respond is loving simply and selflessly. Economic justice. This is just not one of my passions, so I have a hard time talking about it for a long time. But um, this um, 
would basically cover the dignity of work. Um, and it talks to about social, um, well, it talks about socialism and capitalism, but social different, uh, economic endeavors and how they benefit or don't benefit society as a whole. So if you don't know what socialism and capitalism are, they're in there, they're in your books and explain, but what the church teaches is in regards to economic justice is that the economy must serve the people, not vice versa, and the dignity of work is safeguarded when workers' rights are respected. According to the church, all workers have the right to productive work, decent and fair wages, and safe working conditions. So all of Catholic social teaching actually started from this issue. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you the year, but it was when the Industrial Revolution was either starting or ending, and there was a lot of abuse in the workforce, as in meaning there were men who wanted to provide for their families, but they couldn't unless they worked endless hours and then they could barely get by. And so um, people were not taking, people were unable to take care of their families because unless they worked so many hours a week and eventually worked themselves to death, they still couldn't provide for the needs of their family. And so the church responded to that issue during that time. And from there, there's been a, a lot of different, a lot of very similar responses to society and the problems we have, um, the church addresses them in light of the gospel. Um, and then we're called to be stewards of creation. Subsidiarity, you guys probably know what this is, um, just in case you don't. It relates to the role, um, the government or state's role in the lives of individuals in society. It talks about how justice and human welfare are best achieved on the most immediate level. So, the example I always use when talking about this is in the school. Like, let's say I were to have a problem with one of you students. Um, I would go first. I would try to deal with it myself. And then if I couldn't handle it, I would go talk to my department head. And if she couldn't handle it, she would probably go talk to the dean of students. And it was an even bigger issue. She would go talk to um, Mr. Sajak. And if he couldn't handle it, then we would go talk to Sister Lenore. And so it's the idea, though, is that issues in my classroom should be handled by me. And so if there's a conflict and somebody went to somebody other than me, other than for the, with the conflict, it would be hard for me to deal with it. But the whole idea of subsidiarity is that, like as far as society, not in the school, um, but larger structures, structures, social and political, should only intervene when individuals or communities are unable to help themselves. Um, and so in society, um, that like the example your book gives is the education system. So different schools do have some freedom as far as how things are done. Um, but if they do a bad job or have conflict, then the state might get involved. And lastly, this is sort of a short one. Um, and it's kind of an important one, but your book just doesn't talk that much about it. So there's a JP2 quote, John Paul II, who's now a saint. Um, and he says that the family is indeed sacred. It is the place in which life, the gift of God, can be properly welcomed and protected against many attacks to which it is exposed. And can develop in accordance with what can constitutes authentic human growth. In the face of the so-called culture of death, the family is the heart of the culture of life. And so that's important because that's where everything begins. No matter whether or not you have a good, bad, or ugly family, this is where our education, this is where our concept of love, this is where everything begins. And so if it's not a good structure, then there, that's a problem. And so that's why it's important that the family is the model um, that resembles the Trinity. And so, um, yeah, basically that's it. Um, care of the family must be the heart of social programs. 
All Catholic social teaching reflects on the basic moral truth and an extension of natural law. I don't know if you guys know what natural law is. Um, it's defined on page 243 in your books. Um, natural law is the moral sense that God gave people to know through their intellect and reason what is good and what is evil. Natural law is written on the human heart and in all of God's creation. So in short, um, natural law, like let's say people are not exposed to the Ten Commandments. If somebody's never been told not to kill, God still gave them because of their nature, because God blessed them with what we call natural law. People know intrinsically, just through their intellect, not through an education system, what is good and what is evil. And so that's what we believe is the church, and that's what um, natural law is. Lastly, so this is your conclusion. Um, this is ultimately a summary of everything we've learned, sort of, not quite, but this whole semester. So after the comprehension questions, as a class, go to page 244 and read the entire page. So just maybe a couple of you volunteer for your sub and go through the whole page. Um, and then when you come in on Tuesday, You'll get your rubric for your final, and I will have by then done a video uh, explaining what's expected of you. So, yeah, have a good weekend, ladies. Comprehension questions.